preached some of these scriptures last week, but did you ever get done preaching something or studying something and all of a sudden you figure out you didn't get enough out of it? So when I went home last week, I got to thinking about it. I had a couple of different places that I wanted to go with this, and um, I actually went ahead and prepared to move beyond it. Got up this morning and was looking over everything, you know, while I was drinking a cup of coffee. How many of you know coffee helps? <laughs> Amen. And, um, you know, I get up at 6 o'clock, and then, you know, we drive to get here. And uh, so I get, it has, me time, has time for me to get everything settled in me, and, you know, I pray on the way here. You know, it, it just does me good. I mean, it, it really does to have that, that little bit of time. And um, <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you need to go back and cover this again. So guess what? Don't get mad at me for covering it again. <laughs> go to him, okay? And uh, so in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, we're talking about, and let me give you the title again, The P's of Being a C. And I know some of you look at me crazy every time I do that, but I had a conversation with a guy, and I labeled it that way years ago. Him or I won. He said, oh, the P's, or I said, oh, the P's of being a C, the problems of being a Christian sometimes. So we're talking about some of the things that, come, that can come against us, and how many of you know just because we get saved don't mean we're perfect? I should have got a bigger amen than that. <laughs> I just think so anyway. But just, just because you get saved doesn't mean you don't have problems. Come on, y'all, just because you get saved doesn't mean you still, you, you don't have issues. Life creates issues. We have to learn how to deal with them right and handle them with the power of God. And sometimes it's just as easy as speaking the name of Jesus over something and it all working out great. Sometimes, guys, there's warfare involved. It really is. Sometimes you have to pray and pray and pray. How many of you are praying for family members? How many of you know, you don't, what, what, what do you do? Do you just give up or do you keep praying until you see the answer come to pass? So you just, you just stay in there. So this is what it says in Galatians 5, 16 through 18. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Everybody say that with me. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These, these are contrary to one another, so that, you, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, it's so important for us to understand, the Bible says that we're supposed to walk in the Spirit. How many of you know that takes responsibility on our part? I can know the way to go. If I stand there and just pray for somebody to push me down the street, I'm not going to go that way. Does everybody follow me? You've got you to gotta walk it. You really do. You have to step in to what God has done for you. You have to engage the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, into your life. So this is necessary for us. Now, I preached this pretty hard last week. Let me get into this in the Amplified. It says, it says but I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to, controlled, and guided by the Spirit then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh. That's of the human nature without God. Come on, y'all. So how many of you know it's possible for us to act unsaved? Even though we're born again, it's possible for you not to act like it. Look around at people. No, don't do that right now. <laughs> but it's possible for you to act like you're unsaved. doesn't mean that you're not born again. It just means that you're not walking according to how God tells you to walk. How many of you know some things have to change in your life? You've got to allow grace not only to affect you inside, but you've got to allow grace to affect you on the outside too. There has to be a change of character. There has to be a change of who you are. <clears throat> you need to act like the godly man or woman that God has called you to be. You need to do these things. We covered some of them last week and... You know, I, 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 want you to, I want you to work in the fullness. Now listen, where I wanted to get to here was it says, the desires of the flesh are pro opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh, which is the godless human nature. I love this right here because it paints the picture for you. For these are antagonistic to each other. That word antagonistic means they have, there's active opposition. How many of you, the Holy Spirit's pulling at you to do the right thing? Your flesh is pulling at you to do the wrong thing. And your mind is the one who's going to decide which way you go. 
So if you get, if you let the flesh just totally control you, how many of you know you'll run over people and stuff? I mean, you will, you know, and, but if you let the Spirit control you and, and, and let the Holy Spirit, through your spirit, get your mind right, get your head right, keep your head out of the gutter, keep it in the place that it's supposed to be, then you'll make proper decisions. You'll make good choices. You know, you'll, you'll do what you're supposed to do. All right, so they, they fight one another. They're, they're, in, they're in constant opposition, active. I like that. It, it says active opposition against one another. So there's a battle going on inside of me. Can I talk about me? Okay, can I talk about you too? There's a battle going on inside of us for which way we're going to walk. It's, and, I, and I hate to use it, but it's like we have a split personality. We know what the Holy Spirit says and what the Word says, but by goodness, I'm telling you right now, it just seems like it's more fulfilling to get even. Which is not spiritual. Come on, y'all, let's be honest. It, it just seems like it pleases the flesh so much to go and say that to that person. Just let them know how I feel about it. And then put a glory to God on it so you feel spirit. Come on, y'all. I mean, we can do it, and we can. We can, we can be opposed that way. But now let me show you what happens. And this is two, verses, two portions of Scripture I didn't get to last week. And uh, I didn't give these to you, so don't worry about them. We'll let people turn to them. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Since we're in Galatians, I want you to see this. So, you know, the church at Galatia was being challenged to stay in the Spirit. Everybody say it with me, walk in the Spirit. Now, how many of you know that means they must have been having trouble staying there or it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a letter to them? Yeah. All right, there's a lot more in here, but this is where I'm focusing at right now, and I want you to see this. So he goes back and he talks this way. He says... Listen, how many of you know they were born again? They had to be filled with the Spirit because they were walking in the Spirit. Come on, y'all. You know, we look at this stuff and we don't think sometimes. But then in, in chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, listen to what he says. Oh, foolish Galatians. How about if I started my sermon like that with you every Sunday? Oh, foolish church. Don't you know, that's just an encouraging word, but what he was trying to point out, where they were, pro where the problems were, because a lot of times, guys, part of what I have to do as a pastor is to point you in the right direction, but also show you where you're missing it sometimes. And how many of you know, when I show people where they're missing it sometimes, they don't like it? I mean, when you tell your kid where he messed up, does the kid like it? A lot of times, I've never had one of mine say, oh, thank you so much for correcting me. That's the most, it just doesn't happen. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? And, and I want you to see this. This is what he starts off, oh, foolish Galatians. And then he goes into this, listen, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? So in other words, when we walk in the flesh, we allow ourselves to come under the spell of the flesh. Can I do it this way? And it's like it bewitches us in such a way to where we get so used to walking that way, we forget about the things of the Spirit. And I've had people tell me this. You know, I've shared this story before, but we had a lady in our church, not here, but um, in a different church that we were pastoring. And um, <clears throat> before I started, with, well, actually, before we started the church, her family went to um, root doctors, witch doctors. Okay, that's what they would do. And they would go and they would pay this guy money. And when they pay money, he would say, all right, I'll, I'll do this spell for $1,000. Okay, and I need, I'm just using this, I don't know that this was the amount. I need 500 of it down. And then to finalize the spell, all right, you'll see the beginning evidence of it working. But then to get it in place so it stays in place is another $500. Now, how many of you know, how do we, what if we preach sermons like that? All right. But see, we don't do that, do we? All right, come on. So this lady went to this, this root doctor, got the spell cast, but then got saved. Now, come on, y'all. How many of you know? And everybody says, amen, hallelujah. But how many of you know? 
she could hear that guy speaking to her because he called her and said, where's the rest of my money? And she said, well, I'm a Christian now. I don't do that anymore. Now, how many of you know the devil really likes that? Come on, y'all. The enemy really likes that. I mean, really does. So this is what happened. He said, you will pay me the rest of my money, and if you don't, I'll do things to you that God can't undo. Now, she bought into that. And how many of you know she had things happen in her life? I can tell you story after story because she never broke free. She never got freedom from the spell. Come on, and this is, this is, you know, I point this out a lot when I preach this verse of Scripture because this is what he says to the church at Galatia. Listen to this, Galatians. He says, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. It wasn't that they didn't know it. They come under something, some other pressure that stopped them from walking in it. Do you see why I wanted to go back and get these? So, so what will end up happening is, is if we're not careful, we'll disconnect spiritually from things that, you know, and I'm going to use this, guys. Don't, get, don't nobody get upset, but we need to hear this. We'll disconnect from church. We'll disconnect from Christians. We'll hang out with the world. We'll go to these bars. We'll go to the places where we think we can be fulfilled. And then all of a sudden, we're acting fleshly, and we come under the spell of the world. And it never gets fulfilled. It just goes from one level to the next level to the next level, whether it's something sexual or whether it's something, you know, in our minds that we need just to satisfy us or whatever the case may be. We chase a freedom that we can never get. And that's being under, that's being bewitched. I mean, it really is. So you know the truth, but you don't obey the truth. We know what the Word says, but, man, you know, when I'm in church, I can, I can really do what the Word says a lot easier when I'm here than I can when I'm in Walmart or at work or maybe both driving. If you work at Walmart, you're really there, aren't you? I'm just saying, you see, so it's easy for us to do that. And and then he goes on to say, uh, before whose eyes Jesus was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. In other words, you know the truth. Everybody say that with me. You know the truth, but you make a decision not to walk in it. What does that do? That puts you under the spell of the flesh. I'm going to paint it a little bit different. Now, if you will, go to chapter 5 and verse 1. Now we're told, how, how do we stay free? Because this is what ends up happening, guys. You know, when I got saved, I figured out real quick that just because my spirit man was born again, my head didn't get saved. And I tell people this all the time. I told a preacher this not too long ago. You know, you need to get your head saved. You really do because, we'll, you know, God takes care of this part for us. All we have to do is accept what he says, accept the price paid. But how many of you know this thing's a different story? This thing, the Bible says you renew your mind with the Word of God. Yeah. All right, to renew something means you've got to put the Word in it and polish all the, d- the rust off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes something sometimes. We've got, we got to get new, uh, new pr- I call them formulas, but principles down in our lives where we act like God says we're supposed to act. We don't get even with people. You know, I've used this one. Somebody needs this in their day. You don't get even just because somebody does you wrong. Even though you may have the right, it's not right. So then we can look at it from a different way in Galatians chapter 5. I hope I get off of these today. But anyway, Galatians chapter 5, it says that we have to stand fast. Come on, y'all say it with me, stand fast. In other words, be quick to respond to things, and, and, but respond in a godly manner. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So to walk in that freedom means i got to stand fast. That means i got to pay attention to stay in freedom. It really does. I mean, you, you ever walked out of the door at your house, just had something else on your mind, didn't pick up your keys, and closed your door, and you locked yourself out of your house, and immediately when the door goes, your mind goes, I don't have my key. You own the house, what's the big deal? 
well, you locked yourself out of your house. But it's my house. But yeah, but you're locked out of your house. You can stand on the porch and yell, this is my house all day long. But if you hadn't got a key, you can stand on your own porch or figure out how to get in. See, this is how we live our lives sometimes, guys. Uh, we'll, we'll go back and we don't stand fast in the liberty that Christ has given us. And to stand fast means to take that stand quick. I'm just going to do it. I know it goes deeper than that, but take that. In other words, be quick to respond godly. Yes. Come on, y'all, be quick to respond godly. I mean, be fast to get in, get in where God is. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? Because this is what ends up happening if you don't stand fast. Um, you know, then it says right here that you'll become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And you'll just go back to doing the same thing you used to do and wonder why you're getting the same things you used to get. And then be praying to God for things. Why aren't things different, God, but you're still living the old you, getting the same result that the old you used to get and blaming God for where you are when you're not standing fast in the liberty that Christ has made you free. Come on, y'all, it takes a lot. Did you know it takes a lot to stay free? It does. This is why the Bible says, don't become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Look here, listen to this. I got the Living Bible up here that I was just reading out. It says, so Christ made us free. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get all tied up again in the chains of slavery and Jewish laws and ceremonies. No, don't go back to tradition. It's so easy for us to fall that way. You know, I've, I've had to talk with people here, you know, before about this kind of thing. Learn to fall in the lap of mercy and in, in the lap of God. Don't fall back into the chains and wonder why you're chained. You know, fall in the lap of God where mercy is. You know, I told you this, God already knows you did it. Amen or oh me, but it's the truth. So don't, don't become entangled again with the yoke of slavery or a yoke of bondage. Don't go back into those things. Can I get a big amen? amen. All right, now let me catch up and let's, let's go into this one. If you will go to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 23, I told you I'd come back and comment on this one just a little bit because, um, you know, we're going to start today with I still have imperfections. What do I do with the imperfections of my life? How do I handle those imperfections? Well, you know, you learn real quick. If you hang around somebody very long, you know that, that people are people. Did y'all realize that yet? People are just people. All right, and in church, they may look one way, but at home, they can be people. Just those stinking people. I'm just letting you know, just... Yes, people. somebody come up to my door the other morning. How many of you know I hadn't had a shower yet? I grabbed the first hat that was hanging on the rack, and it was my wife's hat. I didn't even realize it. <laughs> Went out the door with my wife's hat on. No I'm a good girl. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I took it, you know, I took it off after I, I did that because, you know, I, my hair just wasn't quite right. And I just took the ca hat and threw it on the couch, you know, on where she sits. And I told myself, listen, y'all, I told myself, I'm going to hang the hat up before she gets home. I didn't. You know, she walks in the house and walks around where I'm at and looks at that place. She says, who's been wearing my hat? <laughs> well, how I many of you know, there ain't no who's to it. There's only me. I felt like that was not a good statement to make at that point in time. <laughs> like I don't even exist. Well, who's been wearing my hat? Well, see, the thing of it is, it's her hat. I used it, and this is what a lot of people do sometimes, is when we come to church, we get around other people who have sometimes weaker faith and greater faith than we. And we will encourage them or they will encourage us but we're running off somebody, we're wearing somebody else's hat. It fits us while we're here. But we do pretty good while we're around other believers. But what happens when we get away from other believers? If I have unbelief in my heart, 
then that's going to be what bubbles to the surface. And I'll pick up on that, and I'll start operating that way. Well, when we look at this, you know, we all, we all have imperfections, and or if you don't, let me pray for you after service. Um, and I talked about this, you know, sometimes life leaves old trophies on us and damages of my past, and I told you a story about, you know, graffiti, and sometimes we can have the graffiti of the past on us, whether it be from tattoos or whether it be from scarring or whatever the case may be. How many of you know sometimes our past leaves impressions that are hard for us to get beyond? I saw a, I saw a thing of a guy, that he got a, got a tattoo on his, on his calf all the way down to his ankle, and the tattoo artist messed it up. And the only way to fix it was they had to do a total blackout. So they went in and they blacked his calf all the way down to his ankle. So he had just he had just this tattooed black leg. And everybody would ask him and they would say, Why you got that? He said, Well, he said, the tattoo that I had, it was not good. So the only way to cover it back then was to black it out. How many of you know you're talking about going from mistake? to the only answer that's available at that point in time. Well, now they got this new technology out to where they can burn it off. So they showed, I watched this, I like doing this stuff. I watched this video of them just smoking this guy's leg. I mean, the laser's just burning the skin. They got a vacuum cleaner. All the smoke's going in there. And they go around to him and they ask him, hey, is it, does it hurt? And he said, yep, worse than when I got it. I mean, you know, and that's the way we live our lives sometimes. See, we go from, from graffiti to cover. And then damage to try to fix it. But we still have the remnants of the past. Come on, y'all. And it's easy for us to get there. See, we have imperfections. Come on, y'all. We all have them. And things that are left from my past are left on me, sometimes in me. It's amazing to me how many hurts can bubble up so quick in me. I won't talk about you right now, but I'll talk about me, about how somebody from my past has done me a certain way, and if somebody else even hits that way, man, I'll respond because I don't want to feel that anymore. Did everybody follow me? Are y'all getting this? You know? So, so we have these things, and what ends up happening is if we're not careful, let me bring it back to where we were. In church, I can be sweet water. You'll see this in a minute, but outside of church, man, I can be bitter. So let's read this portion of Scripture. I, I just want to comment on it just a little bit more. I told you this. The way you fix the imperfections in your life is you take it back to the architect. Take your temple back to the architect take it to the architect the one who made you who knows you who understands you better than anybody else and you present your body come on y'all what does it say body it didn't say nothing about your spirit you present your body as a living sacrifice and you see that body with its imperfections as holy and acceptable unto God because that's the reason why he Jesus came was to die for your imperfections so why would you run from the answer but it's easy for us to let the past just keep us living in in a dead land where there is no life except when we escape for just a period of time you know I don't think Athena will get mad at me for doing this she asked me she said Pastor, why do you walk through the foyer while praise and worship is going on? How many of you know I'm in the back, I'm, I'm praying. I love greeting people. I mean, I do. I'm a greeter, you know. I love hugging people when they come in. Some of them are friendly, some of them are not. It's okay. I can handle that. You know what I'm saying? But that's the way I am. And I worship. I walk through there praying. I walk through there worshiping, you know. I go through there. and I mean, it's just the way I am, and it's just the way I've always done things. And I make my way up here on the last song. And spend that time, but I'm worshiping the whole time. I'm all, you know, but but sometimes, guys, I, I get to pray for people when they come through those doors, and I would never get to pray for them in front of people. 
because they wouldn't bring that to the front. They wouldn't bring it to the front. Sometimes things go on in people's lives to where they don't want everybody to know. But you need somebody to know so that they can lift you up and they can pray you through and pull you out of that. See, this, this is what we do. We, man, we go home and we're in a dead land. We come to church and we get alive. So a lot of times the only chance I get at some of you is this two hours on Sunday morning. Hour and a half. That's what I get. And you know what? I'm trying to leave a weak impact on you. Imprint on your life. That's what I want to do. I want you to go home and go, man, I want that message not to run out till next Sunday. <laughs> or you can come Wednesday and it. I'm not fussing, just saying. Listen to what it says here in Exodus 15 and 23. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Everybody say it with me, they were bitter. Um, therefore the name of the place was called Marah. And the people complained to Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Well, you know, I'd have, I'd have been... I'm going to tell you right now, you better thank, he better, they better thank God I wasn't Moses. I told them, drink the bitter water, you bunch of complainers. What are you complaining to me for? I, I didn't make them bitter. They've been that way forever. Why are you coming to me with this stuff? I mean, drink the stinking water. What's wrong? You know, no, I wouldn't do that. But anyway, you got to you gotta understand, they complained to Moses saying, what shall we drink? Let me get it back on track. Verse 25, so he cried out to the Lord. Now, this is the proper way to do things, guys. Sometimes things come to you that, that people want to an answer for, and it can be bigger than you. You have to remember this. It may be bigger than your comprehension, but it's never bigger than the God in you. So take it to God. I've had people ask me questions before, and I have to tell them. I don't have an answer for that right now. Just being honest with you, I ain't going to lie to you. I don't have an answer for it right now, but give me a week. I know one that I can get in touch with. Come on, y'all. You can give me the answers, and I'll get it back to you. Now, you may not like it, but you didn't ask me for a word you could like. You asked me for a word that could free you. Now, I ain't going to do that with me, and I thought of something right then. Let's just, let's go on into this, and um. <laughs> God, that would work so good, Lord, no. Um, listen, and he cried. <laughs> no, I can't. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. See, it may be bigger than you, but we serve an all-knowing God. What, and I don't know why, you know, there's probably studies been done or something like that to where, you could figure out now with, you know, science and all what. But isn't it awesome that God knew what tree? I wonder how many trees there were. Yeah. And can you imagine, he, he goes to this one tree. Oh, I could do another one. But anyway, he cuts this tree down. Well, that would make a lot of people happy in this neighborhood, wouldn't it? But anyway, <laughs> cuts this tree down. For those of you who don't know, we got some people in our neighborhood that think trees are ancestors. And when we cut trees down, they come down and fuss at us because we're killing their ancestors, and we don't care. But anyway, um, so, you know, here he is. He cuts down this tree, and he casts it into the waters, and the waters are made sweet. Everybody say that with me. The waters are made sweet. Man, that is so important for us to understand. See, the same thing in our lives, and I'm not going to stay on this much longer. I want to go on to the next point. But, see, man, before Jesus, I thought I was happy, but really and truly I was miserable. Does everybody follow me? And it took a tree to change my life. It's the cross. So you can choose to stay bitter. Or you can choose to be better. But you got to understand the choice is yours. What are you going to do? Are you going to 
Continue to be that bitter individual that nobody can receive from. Can I come over? <laughs> come on, y'all. Are you going to choose to stay bitter? Are you going to let what Jesus did in your life make you a person that other people can come and draw from and drink from and receive from? I mean, it, it's so important. You know, that they made, they made statutes and they did everything and they put this up. And I love what it says here. I just want to cover verse 27. Well, no, let's, let's go back. I ah, probably need to do the whole thing. There he made statutes and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. See, God knows how to handle the things in your lives. If you learn how to apply the word. Now, I believe in the, in the New Testament under the, the New Covenant. We're tested by the word of God. Whether we're going to obey the word of God or not, we have that choice every day. All right, every day we need to obey what the word says. And it says, and it, and, and verse 26, and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes. And there are a difference between statutes and commandments. All right, you need to study that out for yourself. That I will put none of these diseases on you that I have brought on the Egyptians. See, they had the promise that none of this happened. You know, I, I was talking with David a little bit yesterday, and, uh, and we were talking about, it's amazing to me. Can I go off track for just a minute? It's amazing to me how many people, we hear things, you know, the Bible, and, and preachers preach the Bible, and they'll say, well, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be. You know, and, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I looked at that one time, and I said, but, you know, we always focus on the bad that everybody was doing. Did you know there was a righteous man there? So as it was in the days of Noah, there's still going to be righteousness, no matter what everybody else is doing. Right. Did you know one man built a boat yeah. under the direction of God, yeah. saved his family? Yeah. Come on, y'all. A flood came, and we got animals today because of him yeah. and God. <laughs> now think about that, y'all. So we'll focus on, man, it's just going to get so bad. How are we going to breathe? How are we going to live? How are we going to function? Well, how about focus on the other side of that? Hey, here, to, you know, children of Israel, all the plagues came on, and God told them, said, I won't put any of these things on you. They lived there and never had that stuff on them. Come on, y'all. God's got it. He knows how to do it. Let's go, let's go a little further here. He says, I won't put any of the things that I brought on the Egyptians. I am the God who heals you. And they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And so they camped there by the waters. That's important for you to understand that God has provision regardless of what area you are at, at in your life. How many of you know it was, a, it was a trip to go? What was an 11-day journey for the children of Israel? Am I right? 11 days to get into the promised land. Because of their own stupid actions, they spent 40 years... It was an 11-day journey. They spent 40 years wandering around in the desert. Don't you know they had to say, I've seen that tree before. Man, I've seen that tree before. Can you imagine? And, you know, I heard one guy explain it this way. This is what he said. He said it, it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. It was an 11-day journey into the promised land, but 40 years to get bondage out of them. Then they still struggled even after they crossed into the promised land. Had the evidence of God. Come on, y'all. Evidence of God's goodness and still struggled. Now, now, let me take this a little different place and let's go to Psalm chapter 18, verses 20 through 24. I'm going to read this in the message paraphrase. I told you, this is, this is kind of like my salvation story, and I think it, it would be yours too. And I love it in the message paraphrase. Because, see, we can, we can all have these things in our lives where we have imperfections and we can focus so much on the imperfections that we don't move on into the completeness that God says we can be. I can't tell you how many times I've ministered to people and I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one, and they would look at me and tell me, there's no way God could ever want me. And I ask them, how is that? 
please explain what is it that God says you're different than the world? What is it? And they'll share things with me. I'm, I'm just going to be, they'll share things with me that they're doing that I've done. And I'm a walking testimony of the grace of God. And I have to look at them and say, dude, that ain't nothing. That's nothing compared to the grace of God. Come on, y'all, it's nothing. Well, how could God ever look at me when I've been this way? Because he looks through the lens of the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all unrighteousness. Come on, y'all. I mean, that's the way it is. I, I talk with people like that all the time. Oh, I, I can never come to God. I, I've just gone too far. No, you haven't. Listen to this. It says, God made my life complete. Will you say that with me? God made my life complete. This is how it happens. When I placed all the pieces before him, See, this is what I can do. I can take the pieces of my past. I get born again and I take all this stuff. And sometimes we have to bring buckets. Does everybody follow me? Sometimes you can, you can put it in a pillowcase. But I had to bring buckets. There's things about my past that, that I could never preach. The statute of limitations has not went out on them yet. But anyway, I'm just picking... No, not really, but anyway. Um, but I took all this stuff, you know, because one thing I did when, when I got saved was, man, God had some fixing to do in me. How many of you were the same place, huh? He had some fixing to do in me, so I took all the broken pieces because my life, even though I'm born again now, my life is still in pieces. And I placed them before God. I said, God, I, I can't do nothing with this mess. And God was always faithful and said, I know how to fix every situation in your life. You just keep it in front of me. You just keep it in my, under my anointing. Listen to this. I placed all the pieces before him. And then... When he repaired everything, I'm adding this in, it says, then I got my life and my act together. How many of you know it's so important for you to understand? You take the pieces of your life, you put them before God, God fixes it, don't break them again. Is that okay? Don't, don't bust them again. Because, yeah, he can fix them again. But why not go ahead and walk whole instead of just busting everything up? I mean, it would be like, you know, I, I shared the story of my, my brother and my sister-in-law. He was instrumental in helping lay a foundation in me. We'd sit on the bed and study the Word because he, he would come by my room, you know, and he'd see me studying the Bible before I go to bed, and he'd say, he was always funny. He would say, understandest what thou readest? And I'd look at him and said, knowest? He said, well, let me help you. And he would come in and sit on the bed, and I would ask questions, and he would help lay that foundation in me. And it made a big difference in my life, you know. And But but uh, I still had those pieces, guys. I had things that were just in shambles. Did everybody follow me? And, and, and God would put them back together. Well, anyway, when he first got saved, they, were in, they got saved in a Methodist church, him and his wife. And um, the pastor there was a covert Holy Ghost-filled pastor in the Methodist church. So he was getting people saved and getting them filled with the Holy Ghost and had them in the back room speaking in other tongues <laughs> in Methodist Church until the Methodist Conference found out about it. Well, my, my brother and my sister-in-law was literally, they, were, they had pieces of their lives that they were trying to figure out how to handle. And I've shared this story with, there was this big Buddha that they had because they were hippies. So they had this big Buddha sitting in the house and you know, they would always go by and rub Buddha's belly before they got saved. Rub Buddha's belly. Oh, don't be rubbing on Buddha's belly. Leave Buddha alone. 
Okay, and they, but they would do it. But they didn't know any different. Well, then, now they're getting the word in their life, and how many of you know the pieces are starting to come back together? They paid a lot of money for this big Buddha. So they were thinking, we could sell Buddha and make money off of it. Well, and they were, they were talking back and forth. You know, how many of you know they're putting the pieces of their life before God? This is what they're doing. And God's telling them, right, you know, telling them how. So my brother comes home from work one day. And here's my sister-in-law sitting on a sheet laid out in the floor and Buddha busted all in the pieces. She had beat Buddha with a hammer. Everybody, I mean, just busted him into pieces. And um, Now, my brother could have looked and said, well, let's put him back together because we don't know what, no, sometimes, guys, you got to let the past go. Let it go. They wrap the sheet up, tied it in a knot, and put it in the trash. Do you follow me? Sometimes, and if we learn how to handle things like that sometimes, we'll keep a lot of stuff out of our lives. Will you say amen? i got just a few more minutes. Let's, let's do this. So this is, this is what it says. Now I'm alert to God's ways. I don't take God for granted. Every day I review the way he works. I try not to miss a trick. I love this part of this verse. I feel put back together. Will you say that with me? I feel put back together. See, when you place the pieces before God, he can put you back together. So all the emotional baggage and all the, the, the luggage sometimes that comes from our past and all the stuff sometimes, hey, don't get grossed out by this, but... How many of you know, we, we can be saved but still have these suckers on us, like ticks. That'll do everything they can to suck the blood of Jesus right out of us. And we got to keep it right. We got to keep it right. And he says, I feel, look here, I feel put back together. And I'm watching my step. In other words, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do a spiritual backslide anymore. I want to stay right. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. Let me do one more and then I'll close. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. I'm going to read this in two different ones, two different translations. One of them is going to be the um, Living Bible. And you've heard this portion of scripture if you've been in church, but I, I, I just want to paint it in the light of what we've been studying how many of you know there is a way that seems right to a man or to a woman? Come on, y'all. There's a way that seems right. There's a way that can look identical. It can look perfect. It can look right. It can look like the way that we're supposed to walk. But the end thereof is destruction. Okay? The, the end of this way is death. This is what it says. The end of this way is death. So in other words, just because something looks right, doesn't mean that you can just walk down that path. You have to be spiritual enough to discern where this is going to end up. And sometimes that is not making that choice. Please hear my heart, guys. Not, don't even go out with that person. Or don't even allow that video to play. Come on, y'all. You got a song? I got music I love from the 80s. And the 90s, come on, y'all, in the 70s, I got music. But, guys, I don't need to be walking down the road singing with my headphones in. I'm on the highway to hell. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? You need to pay attention to how you're walking. And I know it's got a good beat. Kind of sounded like Jesse Duplantis on that one, didn't I? Anyway. Listen to the living uh, Bible. Before every man, there lies a wide and pleasant road that seems right, but ends in death. Now, there are different kind of deaths. How many of you have noticed there's, there's such a thing as physical death? How many of you know if we're a Christian, physical death has no hold on us? Come on, y'all. But how many of you know there's also a spiritual death to where we can allow things, if we're not careful, not because this is what God does, it's what we do, 
we can walk out from underneath everything that God's provided. I've seen people do this before. It always grieves me, man. I spend time praying for them because I know how the devil works, and normally the end result is worse than it's ever been before in their life. I want you connected to the goodness of God. Does everybody follow me? Guys, just because you're Christian doesn't mean you doesn't have problems. But it does mean that God gives you the ability to handle those issues godly. And God can bring restorations in families. He can bring restorations in relationships. All it takes is both people staying connected to God. That's all it takes. And I, I tell you, I'm standing for my, some in my family. They're connected to God, but they refuse to forgive. I'm connected to God, and I forgive him. Going, oh, it doesn't matter at that point in time who was right or who was wrong. Forgiveness settles all. If you'll just do what the Word of God has to say, it settles all. Golly, what if everybody was just as perfect as you are? I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. What if everybody was just as perfect as you? That'll make you think about how you forgive, doesn't it? How about how you respond? See, because just because you have a C by your name, I'm Rick, and I am a Christian, doesn't mean you don't have the P, the problem. It just means you allow God to help you work through those issues, to work through those problems. And every day we grow. We'll go, go into this one next time about growing in grace. It's important that we grow in grace. Will you say amen? amen. Did you get anything out of this today? <laughs> Let me give you some homework. Can I do this? Because this is going to be dangerous, so I need you to stay right where I tell you to stay. Okay, Job 42, verse 10. Verse 10, verses 12 through 13, and verse 15. I want you to see this because when we, when we come back to this again, this is what I want to do, is God will not leave you in ruins. Yep, I will. Job 42, chapter 42, verse 10, verses 12 and 13, and verse 15. You can read the whole thing, just do it in the light of redemption. Yeah. Amen? Do it under, under redemption's glasses and um, because this is what we're going to be talking about God has God has not appointed us to wrath number one but the next thing is is that God will not leave you in ruins and this is what we're going to talk about and then we'll go into growing in grace God does not leave people in ruins he takes the pieces of our lives and he fixes them will you say amen why don't you stand to your feet and let me pray over you. Uh, Facebook, thank you for joining us today. I meant to mention you earlier. And um, we appreciate, uh, I know we have some that can't make it, and they watch us on Facebook, so we appreciate it so much. Thank you. And I do want you to stand up. Close your, would everybody just bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute? Let's do this. Fa Father, I just thank you for your word that is just true in every area of our lives. And there may be some people here right now that are struggling with past, issues I believe that all of us could say amen to that but God you're able to take those things that have happened in our lives and make them into the biggest message ever especially when they're washed in your blood my God it changes everything when I can go to people and say you know I was once like you I, I lived that way Jesus changed my life. He didn't only change me on the inside. He changed me on the outside too. So he helps me get my act back together. So I'm not just saved and fumbling through life and, and tripping and staggering. But I'm saved and I'm fulfilled. And even in the areas of weakness in my life, he strengthens me. And he brings to pass what could bring him glory with my past. So, Father, I pray over this congregation and all listening and all that will listen that, God, you will show us 
the things in our lives that we need to shift. Most of us know what we need to change. But sometimes there can be other influences and spirits of manipulation that can look so godly, but they're not. So God, I pray for the people in this church's vision to see beyond just the act, but into what's behind it. And God, I thank you right now that by your spirit, you will give us eyes to see the things that we should not do. Because the enemy sometimes comes as an angel of light. Jesus taught that, but that doesn't mean that we can't see through it and know the truth. So God, the pieces of our lives, the things in our lives that we struggle with, each one of us, I just thank you for the Holy Spirit empowering us to overcome. In Jesus' name, and would you say amen if you agree? Nobody looking around still, if you're here today and you never accepted Jesus into your heart, you never prayed a prayer according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, where you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Bible says, the word declares, you shall be saved with the heart you believe unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. If you've never prayed that prayer, would you slip your hand up? I would love to pray it with you today. Because sometimes I look around and I think we're 100%, but I always want to be sure. If you're on Facebook and you never prayed that prayer, we'll post that prayer at the end of service. Pray it, get in touch with us, and we'll send you some information. Amen? All right, church, so what are you going to do with what you heard today? Let's be a doer of the word. Will you say this with me? I am a doer of the word and not a hearer only. In Jesus' name. I give the Lord a shout of praise and you can be dismissed. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Wednesday.